Hello everybody and welcome to this chit chat where I am joined by um, the amazing Nancy Hennessy who is beaming into us from North Carolina. Welcome Nancy. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Um, as I mentioned to you, um, I've been following your work for such a long time and um, it's a real privilege that you give up some of your time and share your expertise. I'm sure there are many, many people across New Zealand and perhaps even in Australia who have watched your um, structured literacy video snippets amongst other things like um, purchased your blueprint for comprehension and watched all of those um, mm -hmm. goodies, but have watched them over and over and over and over because every time we do, Nancy, we take something different from it. So oh. thank you. Thank you for making all of the, that um, incredible information accessible to us. So I'm going to just introduce everybody to Nancy. Nancy Hennessy is an experienced teacher and administrator who currently works as a literacy consultant. While in public schools, she provided leadership for innovative programming for special needs students and professional learning for all educators. Nancy has designed and delivered keynote addresses and multiple virtual and live professional learning events, including workshops, uh, podcasts and training courses on the science of reading and structured literacy. Most recently, reading comprehension has been Nancy's focus. Nancy is the author of the Reading Comprehension Blueprint, helping students make meaning of text, and recently co-authored a companion text, the Reading Comprehension Activity Book, a plan, uh, sorry, a practice and planning guide for teachers with Julia Salamone. Nancy has also written the chapter working with word meaning, vocabulary instruction, and multi-sensory teaching of basic skills, the fourth edition. While serving as a national trainer for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, she co-authored Letters, Digging for Meaning, Teaching Text Comprehension, second edition with Louisa Motes. Nancy is the past president of the International Dyslexia Association and has served as the vice president of the North Carolina branch of IDA in 2011. Nancy received the International Dyslexia Association's Margaret Bride Rawson Lifetime Achievement Award. She was recently honoured with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction's 2023 Impact Award. My goodness, Nancy, what a contribution you've made. And um, I know how esteemed that Lifetime Achievement Award is. So um, congratulations. That's absolutely incredible. Nancy, you're going to chat to us today about structured literacy. So I'd like to hand over to you and ask you to share with us what is um, what is structured literacy? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me thank you for this wonderful, wonderful opportunity. I'm honored to be with you and to be reaching out to teachers across your country. Um, I have a colleague who once said to me, we are the sum of all our teachers. Mm -hmm. And I teacher and I really do believe that. So the more that we can learn together, the more our students can benefit. So uh, structured literacy. I thought I might respond to that by thinking a little bit, if, if this works for you, a little bit about um, what's foundational to understanding what structured literacy is. Mm. And for me, first and foremost, is understanding the connection between language and literacy. Certainly when we review the literature, and I'm always reviewing the literature, mm -hmm. you know, one sees that other experts, and I'm not an expert, I'm a teacher, I'm a practitioner, but other experts tell us that literacy is a secondary system to language. That's the work mm -hmm. of Kate Snow and her colleagues. Mm. And then Louisa Motes reminding us that competency at all levels of language is necessary for literacy acquisition. And of course, then Pamela Snow, who has gifted us with her language house um, and you know, articulated for us the science of both language mm. and reading. So I think keeping in mind that tight connection between language and literacy and having a knowledge of it is absolutely necessary for us to begin to understand what structured literacy is about. Mm -hmm. After mm -hmm. all, 
moving from oral language systems, all right, into a translation into writing. So really, when we talk about structured literacy, we're talking about thinking through how oral language, how these language systems really impact our understanding of the structure of written language. So mm -hmm. I think one thing that we should all keep in mind, a number of years ago, I wrote an article actually for IDA on the language literacy connection and created a bit of a chart with the language systems making connection to the instructional components. And I'm not the first nor the last to do that. But I did that because I think as a young and experienced teacher, I personally didn't have a clue about the mm -hmm. connection language and literacy. I think the second thing that's foundational is certainly the science of reading. And so when we look to the science of reading, which I think many people think is, wow, where has this been? Or this is brandy new, uh, certainly is not. We yeah. have over a 40 year history across the world, really, in terms of looking at how do we come to reading? You know, what happens within the brain? What do we need to learn? How do we go about learning? And so really this body of knowledge that's accumulated over time because of the work of many different disciplines, not just mm -hmm. one, Yes, really brought forward, you know, what are these systems of language? What are these instructional components? How do we go about? And what does this look like in the brain as we develop reading? Because we certainly know that reading is not natural, that it needs mm -hmm. to be explicitly taught. So looking to the work of so many, um, and then most recently, I, I, I keep thinking about the work that NICHD did here in the United States. Um, and all of the centers that were, you know, created across the United States where they were doing different types of research, educational, cognitive psychology, you know, linguistic, um, neuroscience, and so on, and what they've contributed to us. So I think I think teachers need to be aware of that work that's been done. Um, mm. That's part of their knowledge base. It will help them better understand what structured literacy is and why it's effective. And then coming to a place where um, I think Reed Lyon has come to recently, and many know his work, I think. Mm. Because, um, he really led the charge here in the United States for so many years um, and recently has published what he calls his 10 maxims. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to talk about all of them, but there are a couple that stand out for me that, again, I think relate to what structured literacy actually is. And he clearly says to us, you know, speech is natural for almost everyone, but reading and writing is not. Um, it's a cultural invention. We have to directly teach our students how to read and write. Right? Mm. He talks about the fact that good readers are good decoders. <laughs> mm. So in order to be able to get to the goal of reading comprehension, one has to have accurate and automatic word recognition skills. He also speaks to the fact that we should be integrating reading and writing, right? That this is the most effective way for our students to learn and that we should be driven by data. Um, mm. That that data should be telling us what our students are um, capable of, um, where they're at and possibly what we need to do. Um, in terms of meeting the challenges that they may be facing. And then thinking about all learners um, and these maxims being applicable to all learners, English language learners, bilingual learners, and so on. So for me, Carla, those are two, uh, it's it's like foundational knowledge for me. It's like, what do you build? Mm. And mm. so we're th even beginning to think about structured literacy. I think we have to have that knowledge. We have to have that understanding about language being, you know, so, so important, that connection to literacy. And then what is the science of reading, this accumulating body of research, which by the way, is ongoing. It's, it's not done. <laughs> so, mm, yeah. so, so there's another thing for us to be, be considering. Um, uh, learning is our work. <laughs> it's ongoing. And we have, we, we have to be willing to change, have the courage mm. to change moment, but also to, to change in the future if, if the science takes us to another place. Mm. That's, a long, yeah, mm. that's a winded way to get to, to what is structured literacy. But I think, I just think those, those two areas um, of knowledge need to be understood in order to understand really the importance of structured literacy and what it is. Mm. So. And and I think too, as I listen to you, you know, I think that makes so much sense because 
we are embarking on in our respective countries, we're embarking on quite possibly the biggest shifts in education that have ever occurred. And so we know that understanding the why, the, the where things have come from, really help us, don't they, to to be able to make that change and, and for it to be a transformational change and not just a sort of fly-by-nighter and, oh, this didn't work or, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I think as I've worked with teachers over the years, um, one of the things that I've always asked them when I've been in their classrooms and working with them is, why are you doing that? What's the why mm. behind and mm. for me, why does need to lead back to, you know, that there's a language connection and that the science is telling us. And so, so many of us who have been doing this work, you know, have said, you know, if not science, then what? What should be driving? Yes. What should be yeah. driving? So um, I know it's not always easy to read the science. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes individuals like yourself or myself, we're put in the position of having to make you know, the translation or, mm. or bridge. <laughs> mm, um, yeah. But um, I think that's really important work and it's important for educators to know um, that um, that's foundational, that that's where mm. we need to start. And you bring up such a good point about it's not a fly by night. It's not, no. it's, it's not another fad. No. You know? um, it, this is something that is some, some of us who have been in the field for a long time have been saying, why haven't we done this? Um, yeah. What about these students who haven't learned how to read or haven't mm. learned how to read well? All right. Mm. Why why have we not stopped to do this? And and there mm. are lots of reasons for that. And I think we need to put yeah. that aside and now just move forward. Yeah. Mm. But your approach of um, I guess sort of you know us stopping in our tracks before we come into the what is structured literacy how do we do it etc cetera, etc cetera. you've really taken us back to that well hang on a minute before we go there what do we know about the foundations of learning to read what do we now know and need to think about um in regards to like you said about how the brain does actually learn to read what do we need to know about the connection about spoken language and written language and, and how that potentially how that's evolved um, over time. And then the other thing I took was around the specific relationship around that you you talked about um, some of those points of um, of read lines. In particular, I wrote down reciprocity between reading and writing so that's my kind of interpretation of what of what you were saying yeah. but often you know we we know and experience so many misconceptions so if we just kind of park things to the side for a moment and, and sit ourselves as individuals that are leading or working through this change and think about well what do I actually know about the foundations of learning to read really yeah. know yeah and yeah. then when I'm going and making decisions around you know, the resources I'm using, the what do you, everything that I'm doing, how will they enable mm -hmm. my ability to support the development of those foundations in line with what the science tells us about how that development works? Yeah, it's, you know, when I think about myself, if I go back in my history, you know, what, what led me to the International Dyslexia Association, where boys in middle school who couldn't read, all right, um, mm -hmm. and, as well as a history in my own family, all right? Right, yeah. And uh, my first experiences really were with program and curricula mm -hmm. that were structured literacy, multi-sensory teaching, and so on. Mm -hmm. It really wasn't until, I mean, I had a sense of the research, I had a sense of the science, but it really wasn't until I began to work with Louisa Motes and began mm -hmm. Um, on the very first edition of Letters, um, with our small group of national trainers then, began to delve into this, because this is what Letters does. It provides you with that knowledge base, as you know, all right? Mm -hmm. So me, I'm sure for others as well, um, I know for others as well, this was eye-opening. This was an yeah. aha, and it yeah. really provided the rationale for, oh, mm. why I should change. This is why... Mm personally, but those that I was working with and others, this is why we should change. Um, mm. 
So I think going back, to, always going back to that, I think is important. But then, of course, as a teacher, as a practitioner, we want to know what we should do. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, because we're solutions based and literally doing the practice, but, right? So, OK, yeah. well, and sometimes it's, that's all very well and good. But what does it look like? How do yes, I do it? That's exactly <laughs> right, because because they're, they're sitting in the classroom with children um, who have needs or, and they're trying yeah. to those needs. So, yeah. I, I understand that as well. And so mm. sort of coming back to what structured literacy is, um, and I know I know you're well aware of what it is, but mm -hmm. for your listeners, for me, it's an umbrella term, all right? Mm. And I mm -hmm. see swirling. I love her work. She has a new book out, which I think is phenomenally in informative about structured literacy. Um, she calls it an umbrella term, and I think that's right because it really mm. – really encompasses many different program or curricula, or even methods sometimes, right? Yes. So it's an approach. It's not a curricula. It's not a program, right? Under this umbrella, <laughs> um, we can find um, programs and curricula and, and methods. That's true. Um, but we have to keep in mind that it's really all about the structure of the English language. It's the mm -hmm. structure written language. Um, it approaches it from an integrated perspective. Um, it's it's telling us how we should go about teaching our students both to read and write, and it's integrating those two aspects of literacy. So I think that's important to keep in mm -hmm. mind, right? And, um, you know, it's derived from, it's based in what we've just talked about, these language systems and the science of reading. And so knowing that and then moving forward in terms of what it actually is and identifying the components, you know, we have the why, <laughs> all right, then identifying mm -hmm. the components, well, what's the what, <laughs> you know? Yes. And, yeah. and you know, what, what, what do program or curricula um, address that would be considered? you know, the components of structured literacy, what would make it different? And of course, um, beginning with those language systems and thinking about phonology and working with the sounds within our language, well, how does that translate then into instruction? Well, our students need to be able to work with the sounds. They need to be mm -hmm. able to identify, to segment, to blend phonemes or sounds, right? And, and then building onto, building onto the sound, they also need to, to learn about the letter of letters, the graphemes, all right, that represent those sounds, mm -hmm. right? And then how those sounds, all right, um, combined with their symbols, some people would call them symbols, um, the phoneme grapheme correspondence, how those are used to build word and how mm -hmm. we can teach students then to work their way through word. And of course, we're always beginning with simple words, uh, uh, more regular um, uh, combinations or patterns, and then eventually teaching them about the patterns and how the patterns of our language work, um, the orthographic patterns. So, you know, when we hear the sound, what are the different ways we can spell that? Mm -hmm. um, A-C-K, well, why? <laughs> you know, and oftentimes I hear teachers talk about rules, but for me, they're not so much rules, they're generalizations. It's an understanding mm -hmm. pattern and kind of it, it, it internalizing that when I see that, that this is what's happening and this is the way that I can read that um, or mm -hmm. how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually building on that to syllables. <sighs> and so... Um, Although certainly one syllable words are representative of, um, you know, the alphabetic principle, the connection of uh, connecting the uh, sound and symbol and then putting it together to read word. And eventually moving on to morphemes. All right. And uh, of course, morphemes being meaningful units um, within speech and so on. So in thinking about just in thinking about word recognition, I think. You know, when we talk about structured literacy, we're really talking about instructional components that address word recognition. Mm -hmm. Word recognition, both in terms of being accurate, being able to read the words correctly, but also reading them automatically, right? Mm -hmm. And that, yeah. that, that knowledge base, that's a deep knowledge base for teachers because many of them, this is not the way they were taught, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, and We're, how do you teach what you don't know and and don't have on tap to be able to explain? 
Yeah, you cannot. You cannot teach what you do not know. And you certainly mm-hmm. can't then respond to student difficulty or error if you if you mm-hmm. don't have knowledge base yourself. So, you know, thinking thinking it through, you know, looking at, well, what are the sounds within our language? And what is the mm-hmm. difference between those sounds? And how do we go about teaching our students those sounds? And then working with them in terms of, uh, of these different patterns, the one, for instance, that I just mentioned, but there are several different patterns. And teaching... Mm-hmm them about syllable types you know Mm -hmm. um you know beginning with a closed syllable which is the most common syllable type in our language Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then building out from single syllable to multi-syllable words Mm -hmm. and always always thinking about how you're building those connections and really going back to what it is that they've already learned and building off of that you know Mm -hmm. so uh, um you know being being systematic but being cumulative about it so, mm. um, and morphemes, I have to tell you, I think morphemes are so underrated <laughs> mm. um, because I, I, when you talk about getting your the, the biggest bang for the buck, well, not only do morphemes help us read word, chunk word, but they give us meaning. That's so, the scene. Mm. yeah, it gives us meaning. So, you know, when you begin to look at these components and you can look at the IDA infographic, for instance, um, and others, um, you know, uh, you can look at the reading rope and look at the lowest strands of the reading rope. You quickly begin to see what's necessary in order for students to be able to read accurately and automatically. Mm. Sentences, mm. Letters, phoneme, graphing, correspondences, syllables, morphemes. Yeah. And then always working for that fluency, for that automaticity. Yeah. Um, so, Nancy, when we think about a lot of what we've talked about and that sort of, you know, development of um, the complexity of language. And really what you're saying is that structured literacy um, provides us with an order of um, how to teach. And we know you you use the term systematic and cumulative. Um, We know that we now know that um, we will be more likely to have success if we teach language in a systematic way, and we do it in a, in a cumulative manner where um, a concept builds one from the other to develop complexity. So we're using what we know to stem from that to go into learning what we haven't yet learned. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the development of um, the orthographic patterns and the increase of those from simple to complex, going into the complexity through syllables and multisyllabic words and beginning to look at morphemes. So like you mentioned, a lot of that is about addressing that word recognition strand of the reading rope. What about talking a little bit about the language comprehension piece? And you touched on with um, with the morphemes and leading into morphology and, and, and that bridge to understanding word meanings. Yeah. What's the place for comprehension in, in the science of reading findings? And, you know, is comp- comprehension and the explicit teaching of comprehension a part of structured literacy? Yeah, well, it absolutely has to be, <laughs> right? If we just go back to read Lyons Maxim, you know, what's the goal of reading? Mm-hmm. It's comprehension. And so mm-hmm. uh, if we look at any of the models, if we look at the reading rope, for instance, the upper strands are all about language comprehension and word recognition in concert with language comprehension, hopefully, hopefully results in skilled reading mm-hmm. and skilled reading. And these are Hollis Scarborough's words. It's really the fluent, you know, uh, execution and coordination of word recognition and text comprehension. So they mm-hmm. go in hand. It's interesting because I was just working on something um, that I've spoken to before. Fact, not fiction, the science of reading does include comprehension, right? <laughs> and uh, and, and um, when one looks again at the infographic, we can see the IDA infographic does speak to vocabulary and sentence mm-hmm. structure, text structure, and something that they call critical thinking. I tend to think mm-hmm. about levels of understanding where we can work with, you know, literal to inferential understanding and then develop mental models. So I've been on this bandwagon about comprehension. Yes, I was for many years a decoding queen. I have Orton background. So when we talk about those program and curricula, you know, there are many different program and curricula that fall mm-hmm. under that umbrella, Orton being one. 
Um, I have background in multisensory structured language teaching. And so that's really what I spent a good amount of my time training other teachers and being certain that the schools that I worked in had those programs for students. Because of my work with Louisa Motes, not that I neglected comprehension, I knew that that was the goal, but I really, it set me on a journey of learning and I really, really dug deep <laughs> and have been digging deep ever since. So I think what all teachers need to know is that yes, in the early grades, we want to focus on students acquiring word recognition. This is this is for the this is the on ramp to reading proficiency. Yeah, right? yeah. At the same time with with those littles, those younger children, we need to be reading to them and we need to be reading to them age and grade appropriate texts. All right. Texts mm -hmm. that are written in academic language so that they can move beyond hopefully their everyday language. All right. Basic language and learn about more sophisticated vocabulary words, sentence structures, begin to think a bit about the way that text is organized, moving from discourse or a language to mm -hmm. the way that we structure up um, our thoughts, um, narrative or informational text, and helping them to be thinking more deeply about what it is that they're hearing. Um, and by the way, we need to keep doing that hearing, providing access to the older students who still haven't acquired word mm -hmm. recognition. I have had the experience, I've worked all the grades, um, but I did work primarily middle to high school. I know those students who are more than capable, who haven't learned how to read, who didn't have access to text that was written in academic language, and who then struggled because they didn't have the background knowledge, the vocabulary, the syntactic structures necessary to deal with the more complex texts that they encountered mm -hmm. and moved through the grades. So I'm concerned that, um, uh, and I think this is kind of a caution for all of you as you continue mm -hmm. on your journey, and you've probably <laughs> already seen this happen, where people begin to say, well, the st structured literacy is only about phonics. No, it's not. It, yes, it's about <laughs> word recognition. But it's about getting our students to a place where they can comprehend what it is they're hearing, if they're reading by mm -hmm. ear or mm -hmm. by ear, all right, so that they can learn. I mean, what's the point? Oftentimes, I, I step back and I say to myself, it's very important that we acquire all these literacy skills, all right? Why? So that we learn, so that we learn mm -hmm. from text, even so we learn from listening, you know, so we yeah. learn speaking. Mm -hmm another, but particularly so we learn from our text. So I appreciate that you asked me that because mm -hmm. I'm on the comprehension bandwagon and <laughs> as structured literacy does address, and yes, we can explicitly intentionally mm -hmm. teach mm -hmm. word meaning, mm -hmm. syntax structures, text structures, and so on. All right. We, mm -hmm. we certainly can do that. Scope and sequence is a little different in terms of comprehension than it is for word recognition, but there are some areas in which we can even um, mm. outline. And we do build, it is cumulative. Think about a vocabulary word. When yeah. we, teach, and we continue to teach more about the nuances, the multiple meanings and so on, the idiomatic expressions that those words might be used in. Yeah. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's really good to sort of, I'm gonna say clear the ear on that. Um, a couple of things that I picked up, one was around those students who are older and presenting with word reading challenges and are potentially, um, <clears throat> excuse me, reading through an instructional mechanism, perhaps um, decodable text for the purpose of developing their word recognition skills. We're seeing a real increase in understanding from teachers across the country that actually it's really, really beneficial and crucial actually for those students to have that instruction, but to also sit in and like you said, ear read what is age appropriate or curriculum level appropriate um, yeah. reading material to build, to build to build their vocabulary, to build their intellect, to build their knowledge about whatever it is that they're reading about and um, mm -hmm. and studying. And often we see those students pick that um, content, knowledge and information up so quickly through that ear reading mechanism. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, I think one of the things that we have to always be reminding ourselves is mm -hmm. all 
students come to us with difference, all right? Um, and they are capable, and we need to mm -hmm. believe in their capability, and mm -hmm. we need to provide the means for them then to achieve, all right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's a student who has a learning disability such as dyslexia, or a student, for instance, here in the United States who perhaps, ha um, you know, uh, is an ELL, English language mm -hmm. learner, mm -hmm. yes. we, we need to acknowledge their capability, not put roadblocks, you know, in place for them, allow for them to continue to achieve with their peers mm. by thinking about how we differentiate instruction for them. Yeah. But always, always giving them access to that text, um, mm. different scaffolds and structures and so on. Yeah. And I often think too, Nancy, it's no different to how we talk to our toddlers and we are either consciously but most likely unconsciously talking to our toddlers because we're building um, relationship and we're building yeah. vocabulary and the ability to speak. Yeah. But actually what we are doing when we know about it is we're consciously building that phonological lexicon in the brain yeah, so yeah. that all of that language is there ready for the connection Yes. from spoken language to to written so and and right. we 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 must continue to understand that that is no different for our older students or our english as second language learners who um who don't have that vast body of vocabulary um and and um spoken language knowledge in that phonological lexicon part of their brain. So if, when we talk about that, for me, it's it's about everything comes together. You know, all of the bits that we learn about, mm -hmm. we can't drop one bit off. We've got to understand that we're talking about language as a complete um, sort of yeah. mechanism for learning and unlocking um, being literate. Yeah, building the opportunities for listening, for speaking, for reading and writing and integrating them throughout. Mm -hmm. And just talking about vocabulary, I was thinking about, you know, it's one thing to have a routine and we should have an explicit routine to introduce vocabulary words. But mm -hmm. then we need to give our students opportunities to practice. Yes, to practice. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be through varied modalities, all right? Mm -hmm. So for me, um, you know, when I talk with teachers about how can we build those kinds of activities? Yes, we can do it through semantic mapping, you know, that visual representations, mm. um, uh, conceptual maps. But it's also really important to include speaking, listening, and writing activities. Um, mm. And that, I, I think, I think sometimes that drops off, you know, and we yeah. Can, um, and yeah. continuing to build that phonological lexicon, when I speak to vocabulary instruction, um, I'm not alone in this. Um, uh, I've learned from others. It's about listening to the word and repeating the word and telling me about the sounds or the syllables or the morphemes that you're hearing within mm. the word. Mm -hmm. So that we've been to that. So yes, it, we continue over time to do this for our students. Mm. So, um, so developing all these different aspects of what I, the reading rope, Paula Scarborough's reading rope, all the strands that go into word recognition, all the strands that go into language comprehension, these are all accommodated for in structured literacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, um, and so, so important that we keep that in mind. Yeah. And our job as, as teachers is to, I guess, have that understanding of the foundation. Where does this all come from? Why is it important? And then sitting in that place of what is structured literacy and how is it organized? And oh my goodness, it's not a program in isolation. It's an approach. Um, it's an approach to teaching and learning that reflects that vast body of research known as the science of reading, as you said, is continuously evolving. And so yep. therefore we must keep our head above the water and yep. try to continuously keep across that as well. Yeah. And so then thinking about, we've, we've mm -hmm. talked about the why and we've talked about the what, but also, um, We've somewhat discussed the how, but just yeah. keep in mind, you know, that that in fact it is systematic. That you know that it mm. builds on, it builds on how we've structured our written language, and so we need to go back and understand that, um, mm. and that needs to come into play. And and for word recognition, that certainly gets um, evidenced in uh, scope and sequence, you know, in a logical progression. That yeah. what's regular to irregular. 
um, what's easier, perhaps, like <laughs> one syllable words to multi-syllable words and so on. But also the the thought of, and I think this is what what sometimes gets lost and um, and is forgotten, but individuals such as Anita Archer remind us of this at all. <laughs> practice, 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 yeah. but practice, practice that is meaningful, that pulls forward, that, you mm -hmm. know, that pulls forward what it is that we've learned. So we have a foundation. We don't leave anything behind, okay? Mm -hmm. Build, building, building in a very direct, explicit way, telling students exactly what it is. There's no guesswork here, all right? Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. pretty here um this is this is what it is this is how it works let's talk about it i'm going to show it to you i'll model i'll demonstrate and then we're going to practice 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 building on what it is that we know so always mm -hmm. moving what it is that we know um mm -hmm. using as we said you know multimodal ways of thinking about um you know i mean structured literacy lesson plans are very well organized yeah they are <laughs> Very structured. And they remind us, they remind us to integrate the reading with the writing. So if I, so if I'm identifying a sound, you know, if I'm segmenting, I'm blending, um, you know, uh, I'm also asked to be thinking about spelling a sound, mm -hmm. you know, go in the mm -hmm. direction. If I'm reading a word, I'm asked to spell words and they're always consistent and regular. So, mm -hmm. you know, with a closed syllable, for instance, beginning with those patterns. So that's that's so, so important. And then thinking about how, you know, how we provide feedback to the student. You know, it's it's always critical that we don't say, no, that's wrong, read it again. Mm. <laughs> but get them to a place um, by asking them perhaps a question. What is the sound of that particular letter? Mm. Um, so corrective feedback that allows for them to understand or that's right. You have the first sound. That's right. You have the last sound. Now let's look at that middle sound, mm -hmm. you know, the medial sound. So I think, um, you know, I think keeping in mind those principles um, um, are particularly um, important. And that's not the way we always teach. So no, no <laughs> it's, that's a big shift to it's it's the shift is really what we're teaching but also how we're teaching and maybe that little bit of well, we didn't know why we were teaching these things in the first place so yeah. perhaps it is all the why what and how that you know it's about um getting across as you were talking about the um the the structured literacy lesson plans and um observing what's going on for the student one of the things that uh, I observe, and I'm sure this is the same in your practice, Nancy, that teachers become so empowered throughout the course of their teaching because they they now know how to interact in a, in a way that is, I'm going to say, cognitively sound from building the capability of the students that they're working with. So they know and they, or they come to learn about the importance of retrieval like you gave that example you gave that example of tell me what sound was it that you were writing here so you're actually trying to activate that retrieval yeah. and you're doing it from a place of I want to really truly understand as the teacher does a student have automatic sound symbol correspondence or is there something going on here that I haven't actually picked up so that yeah. ongoing sort of formative teaching practice yeah. I I I truly can say hand on heart that in my own practice and those that I work alongside, I see we become so much stronger and informed formative um, practitioners mm -hmm. through learning how to teach in a structured literacy approach. Mm -hmm. It really opens you up to understanding why students are making errors. That's part mm -hmm. of what Thing, you know, mm. and so um, being able to actually recognize, oh, that's the why the students spelled that particular word, you know, or that sound in that word in that way. Mm. Understanding the phonology allows mm. you, to, um, you know, make better decisions about what do I do next? How do mm. I provide the corrective feedback that's necessary? But I, but I love what you said about teachers being empowered because I think one of the things that happens. Um, and this is a challenge, I think, as we ask teachers to change. You know, they have beliefs about what they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and mm. and and they come to work every day wanting to do well mm. by their students. And so, it's sometimes difficult for them to give up their beliefs until they actually see those changes in their students. Mm. You know, mm. 
provide them with the necessary supports, enough supports, all right, and they begin to see those changes in their students, all right, well, that helps to change their sense of, yeah. of what should be happening, their belief system, and they make more of a commitment, too, because they do feel empowered. Mm -hmm. I, I always think about um, the fact that, you know, our, our, com our confidence in what comes from what we do is um, based in whether or not we feel competent at doing mm -hmm. it. And when we mm -hmm. see, and when we see success, you know, with our students, um, uh, it increases, you know, this feeling of confidence and competency. Um, and actually, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm, I, I'm, I'm hoping we pay more attention to here in the United States, and that you, as well as others, as they embrace structured literacy or any changes. Um, in instruction is they think about implementation science, you know, mm -hmm. that they think what what are the factors that go into being able to not only implement but sustain change? And one of these has everything to do with whether or not we can, um, uh, you know, uh, provide teachers with enough support over time, all right, mm -hmm. enough knowledge support over time so that they, they get this sense of competency. And, and of course, they yeah. get good training. Mm -hmm coaching. Um, mm. um, I always think about um, uh, the fact that, you know, we we say to our teachers, give your students a continuum of learning opportunities, right, <laughs> so that they can acquire and apply. Well, we need to do the same thing for teachers. Absolutely. Um, the, very, the very last position that I had in school, I was in a regional high school district, I was the director of professional development. And I didn't do a lot of stand and deliver. Yes, we did bring in training, but we always provided those additional opportunities, mm. co curriculum work, study groups, um, professional learning community, overarching theme, so that so that teachers felt supported um, in um, initiating, um, you know, an innovation, putting something mm. new different in place. So mm. all empowering thing comes from that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. And I... I think when I look back to, and I've often shared this here, and um, when I look back at how we rolled out a maths project, some probably now, gosh, probably 15 to 20 years ago. Um, in fact, it is 20 years ago, pretty much. Um, we we did the program to the teachers. We didn't really sit in that space of, well, what's the implementation science? What is it that we really need to know and understand and then execute to ensure that this is a transformational, sustainable change? Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Nancy, for adding that in because it is a topic of discussion that I myself find I talk a lot to um uh, principals and schools about and um, we often really work hard to try to support those school leaders to actually have their strategic plan um, or their roadmap as we sometimes call it for well what is this going to look like in your context with your people and what are the things that we might be blindsided and you know what are the corners we need to look around um, before we get there to ensure it's safe to take those teachers around that corner and that they will be successful. So um, it, it, it's it's kind of this parallel journey, isn't it? You know, we need the implementation science and the considered strategic approach, plus layering on the why, what, how of actual uh, structured literacy. That's absolutely true. All right. I think I think having having a strategic plan, having an implementation plan, is absolutely necessary. And um, you know, having teams that are working on what is it that we need to do year one, year two, year three, acknowledging mm -hmm. this needs to take time. That this isn't just about a program or a curricula. Yes, that's important. Mm -hmm. Give the mm -hmm. teachers what they need to teach, but. Mm -hmm. What that has to happen in order for that to actually take off and actually mm. take root, right? So, yeah. and, and I think mentioning the leaders and supporting the administrators, I mean, you know, I always think about that triangle in terms of implementation science and the drivers. Mm. Right? And so uh, I'm thinking about the competency piece for teachers, but then I'm thinking about, you know, the leadership piece and the systems that have to be in place. So thinking about putting all the systems in place that are going to make this work at different levels, all right? Yes. And then thinking about the leaders, um, you need a champion, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah you, you need a yeah. champ. You need someone who believes, um, who understands, and will be a champion. Um, and so, um, so so important to not say, "All right, we, this is what we're doing. Here's a program. We'll do a little bit of training on this, and then go for it." <laughs> you know, mm. and mm. Um, and heaven help us. So many teachers do go for it because they care so much about their students. But at the same time, I think they can get overwhelmed very easily. I think administrators. Mm too as well, quite frankly. So yeah. thinking about all the supports that are necessary. Yeah. Mm. Is, is absolutely critical. Yeah. So thank you so much, Nancy. This has been an invaluable chat. And I mentioned to you before we came um into the chat about where we we're at here in New Zealand with moving into this sort of um, mandated or um you know real considered strategic government implementation of structured literacy. So I'm really hopeful that the people who have listened in to this chit chat are going to have some some key pieces that they will take away, either to build the knowledge and understanding of why the decision might be made to move into structured literacy implementation or for them to think about what it is, where they sit, have they got um, a depth of understanding in that foundation piece before they even go into what structured literacy is, yeah. uh, where are they at in terms of maybe knowing a little bit more about structured literacy, but actually the how and the benefits of delivery in a structured literacy approach. And then we finished with that piece around implementation science, and that just feels like the icing on the cake, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, well, it's, well, maybe it's not the icing on the cake. Maybe it's the flour in the cake. And if we don't have the flour in the cake or something to make it rise, <laughs> um, then the baking powder, it's not going to be so successful. Yeah, it needs to be in the mixing bowl. <laughs> yeah, I think it does too, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, for everybody that is listening in to us, I um, want to take this opportunity to remind you about our upcoming um, symposia. We're hosting um, two symposia, Nancy, later in the year, one in Wellington in Auckland in New Zealand. And um, we actually are bringing Dr. Anita Archer to New Zealand, which is incredibly exciting. Um, yeah. And so I can just see her pacing that stage. Um, I've seen her at the Reading League conference last year and she was pacing uh -huh. up and down the room as she does. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and so we're really, really looking. Getting everyone involved. <laughs> Absolutely. She certainly practices what she preaches. Yeah. Doesn't she? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we're really, really looking forward to hosting those events and, and focusing on how we can um, implement effective instruction, bridging research to, to practice. Um, yeah, so thank you so much to everyone who's joining us. And I hope that you've found today's chit chat really, really beneficial for your knowledge and hopefully your practice in your setting. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be on a learning journey with all of you.